So uh, my research group at the uh, Center for Molecular Medicine and Therapeutics at UBC is focused on developing novel therapeutics for genetic brain diseases. And today we'll be talking about some of our work using lipid nanoparticles to deliver CRISPR genome editing. And I'll be giving the brief introduction and then my really uh, stellar graduate student, Sarah Thompson, will be uh, carrying you through the, the data that's been supported by NMIN to date. So just some general introductions. Brain diseases represent a very significant unmet medical need. The brain is really hard to get therapeutics into and, and uh, the diseases are, can be quite complex. It also represents a, a massive cost to the Canadian healthcare system. In our lab, we study both neurodevelopmental disor disorders and neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, they can be familial or sporadic caused by genetic diseases, uh, genetic causes or, or environmental, or in, in all cases, a combination of both. But for the sake of today's talk, we're going to focus mostly on just purely genetic disorders that have a clear uh, monogenetic cause of the disease. And we can kind of break down these uh, genetic brain diseases into having two underlying mechanisms. Mutations can cause a gain of function, uh, which is basically a, a novel toxic um, um, species that is produced by the mutation, or the mutation can cause the loss of function and the loss of a, a, a normal protein. And this leads to very direct uh, approaches to therapy. If we have a gain of function mutation, such as we have in Huntington's disease, you want to eliminate or remove that toxic or, or, or misfolded protein. And for loss of function mutations, we need to either repair or replace and increase the, the production of the normal protein. So just with that very simplified background, um, we're going to, we've been focusing really on two different disorders uh, in this program. Uh, both of which represent those two different uh, models of, of disease mechanism. Huntington's disease, which is caused by mutations in the Huntington gene, specifically a poly, it's a, a, a expanded a CAG repeat expansion within exon one of the Huntington gene, and frontal temporal dementia caused by progranulin mutations, mutations in the granulin gene, even a single uh, mutation leading to loss of function cause an age-dependent de dementia called frontal temporal dementia. Uh, so again, Huntington's disease is a good is a, is a primary example of a toxic gain of function disorder, whereas frontal temporal dementia is a hemizygous null situation leading to which is uh, essentially a loss of function of progranulin. They affect different areas of the brain, but again, we've got to target the neurons in the brain to have effective therapies. And again, with a gain of function mutation, we want to reduce that toxic protein. And with a loss of function, we want to either replace or repair the gene to increase the production of the normal protein. The, uh, our, our, our goals in today's uh, talk are to explain some of the advantages of how LNPs may uh, help us to deliver nucleic acid therapies to the brain. Um, we've set out to improve um, some of the LNP formulations through screening. Uh, in primary neurons, both for siRNA uh, approaches as well as for mRNA approaches, and we'll uh, pass on some of the uh, the uh, understandings we've gained from those those studies. And ultimately, we wanted to apply these um, improved formulations to the challenge of LNP mediated genome editing, a much higher bar for uh, therapeutic uh, delivery. And, and Sarah will take you through those those studies. So when we think about current delivery of nucleic acid therapeutics to the brain, there are really two uh, approaches that are currently in clinical um, stage development. Antisense oligonucleotides, an area that I've worked in uh, both in the lab and clinically. In fact, we did the first uh, ASO therapies for Huntington's disease in our clinic at UBC. These are need to, can be delivered directly to the CNS. They don't require any external carrier. They need to have repeat delivery because they're transient, uh, although they may have long-term effects, they, they aren't permanent. Um, there are safety concerns, and these safety concerns have actually become more prominent over time with um, both the possibility of off-target effects, but also toxicity related to the underlying chemistry of the ASOs. Um, they're very well, um, they're, they're very applicable to uh, gene knockdown approaches, which is why they've advanced in Huntington's disease, um, uh, less appropriate for gene replacement, although they can sometimes alter splicing to 
uh, in, in, with certain uh, diseases, but primarily used as gene knockdown approaches. AAV, well known as a, a means of delivering nucleic acids to various tissues. They, um, again, require a viral carrier for the nucleic acids. In this case, they do have long-term effects. That can be good and bad if they're safe. Um, but, um, you know, there also are significant safety concerns uh, and, and unfortunately many recent deaths in current AAV clinical trials. They can uh, deliver siRNA as knockdown or, or mRNA as gene replacement. But what we're really going to focus on today, and I think is of interest to this group, are our efforts using lipid nanoparticle delivery of nucleic acids to the brain. There's some really significant advantages, the primary one being how safe they are. Um, they can be repeat dosed, unlike AAV. The effect uh, can be transient, but also, again, we can deliver either mRNA for uh, gene replacement, uh, siRNA for knockdown, or a combination of guide RNAs and mRNAs for genome editing, which is where we'll finish up our talk today. Um, don't have to tell this group, there's been some really significant advances, and certainly the, the development uh, and fast tracking of the SARS uh, COVID two LNP vaccines by Pfizer and Moderna has important implications for uh, more complex um, LNP therapies. Uh, this is a <laughs> slide is clearly out of date. It's from a review from 2021. And at that time, there were about 30. And I understand from our most recent admin uh, talks that there's over 100 LNP based mRNA and nucleic acid therapies in clinical development. So a really incredibly rapidly developing field uh, of import to this particular presentation. There was a really exciting publication recently in the New England Journal. This represents the first um, in vivo uh, evidence of uh, genome clinical, clinically effective and safe genome editing. Um, this was a CRISPR-Cas9 delivery by LNP uh, of the Cas9 mRNA and guide for uh, a liver disease transthyretin amyloidosis. So really exciting advances. Um, and um, that brings us back to some of our very early work. So really based on some important first uh, principle work done by uh, Peter Cullis and the McVicker lab that showed that LNPs actually were effective in trans, um, uh, trans uh, effective in delivering nucleic acids therapies to the to brain cells. We, we started working with Peter many, many years ago and we're really impressed with the ability of nucleic acids to um, deliver, uh, LNPs to deliver nucleic acids to the brain. This is sort of our workhorse system. It's a primary neurons from mouse in a dish. These are non-dividing post-mitotic uh, neurons, either from cortex or striatum. And here we just delivered uh, an siRNA targeting Huntington, the, 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 the gene in, that causes Huntington's disease. And we're able to show very effective knockdown in ex vivo uh, neuronal cultures. We took those same LNPs and delivered them into the region of the brain, uh, the striatum that is effect, primarily affected in Huntington's disease, and we're able to show a, a significant knockdown. This was really exciting early data, but really um, we hadn't optimized any of the, um, any of the LNPs for, for brain delivery. So we set out, uh, funded by Enmin, to do just that. And um, we knew at that time that we that LNPs were safe and effective uh, with peripheral administration, but there really wasn't any data on what happened when we delivered them to the brain. We had this early data showing that neurons could be uh, transfected by LNPs and that they could be done safely and effectively. And the goal of our uh, initial NMIN pro program was to optimize LNP formulations for the delivery of genetic uh, therapy payloads with the ultimate goal to deliver uh, these uh, therapies to the brain. We focused on sRNA for a gene knockdown and mRNA for gene replacement. And I'm going to pass the baton over to Sarah Thompson since she's actually done all of the work and is the best person to describe how we've used LNPs to deliver uh, nucleic acid therapies to the brain. Sarah, take it away. Uh, so thanks very much for the introduction. And again, I'd like to thank Enmin uh, for uh, organizing this and for encouraging my participation in our lecture today. Uh, Blair has already showed um, some early data from our lab using LNPs, uh, both in ex vivo systems as well as in vivo. Um, but I'd like to start my portion of our talk today um, 
and just take a step back to review why we and the neuroscience and nanomedicine fields in general uh, became interested in the possibility of using LNPs in the brain. So the functionality of LNPs relies on two essential physiological factors. Uh, the first is the presence of apolipoprotein E or ApoE, and also the expression of low density lipoprotein receptors by cells that we're targeting with LNPs. Uh, so when the particles enter circulation, the outer facing lipids in the particles can interact with lipoproteins in serum, uh, which includes ApoE. And these lipoproteins adsorb to LNP surfaces, and when the particles reach target cells, those adsorbed proteins bind with LDLR receptors, which causes endocytosis and allows delivery of nucleic acid into the cytoplasm. Uh, we became interested in using LNP technology in the brain because we, we knew that both of these essential components also exist in the central nervous system. Um, ApoE happens to be the most abundant lipoprotein uh, in CSF. And LDLR receptors are highly expressed by neurons as a component of the brain cholesterol biosynthesis pathway. Um, and as Blair mentioned, we definitely weren't the first people to come up with this idea. And in particular at UBC, this prospect was really nicely investigated uh, by Peter's group as well as Brian McVicker's group. Uh, this uh, figure is adapted from a paper that came out of the McVicker lab, and the panels on the left show ex vivo neurons in the top left seen with DAPI, as well as neurons in a brain section that are seen with live cell dye. Um, LNPs that were used to treat these cells, both ex vivo and in vivo, are shown in the center with a red lipid dye. And then the merged panels on the right just show really nice cellular uptake in both of these systems. Uh, these cells were treated with an siRNA formulation, and we also know that the siRNA was functional and lowered expression of P10, which was the target gene uh, in the brain parenchyma, so in vivo, compared to both uninjected and the non-targeting siRNA controls. Um, as Blair mentioned, we also had worked with Peter for many years, and we were interested in uh, building on this foundational work. So we designed a project uh, that would improve the efficacy of LNP formulations for neuronal delivery. Um, so in order to adapt LNPs for this purpose, we set out and designed an ex vivo screening strategy to identify the best combinations of lipids in LNP formulations for nucleic acid delivery. Uh, we isolated neurons from the brains of mouse embryos and treated them with LNPs after the neurons reached maturity at day in vitro 7. And to identify effective combinations of lipids for neuronal delivery, we manipulated two of the four lipid components in a typical LNP system. Uh, so we focused on ionizable cationic lipids, which promote encapsulation of nucleic acid and also allow for a release from the endosome following endocytosis. And we also looked at different phospholipids, which can modify delivery efficiency. And the ultimate goal of this project was to land on an optimized formulation that worked really well to deliver our nucleic acid payloads. Um, we tested formulations, again, of both siRNA and mRNA, and we did all of these experiments in reporter systems just to avoid disrupting endogenous gene expression. Uh, formulations of siRNA were screened in primary neurons that we isolated from transgenic GFP mice, and after treating those neurons with LNPs containing uh, GFP siRNA, we measured knockdown using qPCR. Um, and then for mRNA, we used formulations containing luciferase reporter mRNA in wild type primary neurons, and we quantified luminescence after treatment. Our first screen was with um, formulations of LNP siRNA, and we compared two ionizable cationic lipids, DLIN MC3 DMA, as well as DODMA. And these formulations were prepared using uh, disteryl phosphatidylcholine or DSPC as the phospholipid. Um, importantly, one of these combinations, MC3 and DSPC, is uh, the same lipid combination that is used in the FDA approved um, LNP siRNA therapeutic on Patro. And this is a really common benchmark in the field when doing formulation screening. 
So in all of the subsequent experiments I show, this MC3 DFPC formulation is our benchmark control. Um, in this study, both of our formulations achieve significant GFP knockdown compared to both untreated and scramble conditions. And we saw that the MC3 formulation was significantly more potent than the dogma formulation at an equivalent dose. Uh, we then moved on to testing the performance of each of the ionizable lipids in combination with three additional phospholipids with unique chemistry. So we tested uh, DOPC, DOPE, and DOPG. Um, and what we saw was that each of these formulations had a significantly different effect on GFP expression and knockdown. So when prepared with MC3, we saw that the DOPG formulation was the most potent. And then when we did the same screen with Dogma, we saw the same trend. Uh, so based on this, we conclude that for siRNA delivery to primary neurons, DOPG formulations are more potent than formulations prepared with other phospholipids. Um, we then went through the same uh, type of screening protocol using systems with mRNA. Um, and we started with the same two ionizable cationic lipids, MC3 and Dogma, uh, formulated with DSPC. Uh, but here, unlike with the siRNA formulations, we actually saw that the Dogma formulation at the same dose was much more effective for mRNA delivery than MC3. Uh, we also completed the same phospholipid screen again, beginning with formulations of MC3. And in this case, the trend that we saw for siRNA delivery uh, was maintained here. So the formulation containing DOPG was the most potent. Um, but when we did this screen with formulations containing Dogma, we saw a different trend. So in this case, it was actually the DOPE formulation that was the most effective. Um, and here we basically see that um, the best phospholipid for mRNA delivery actually depends on the type of ionizable cationic lipid that's present in the formulation. So compared to our um, LNP formulation that we used as a benchmark, the MC3 DSPC control, this project has been able to improve neuronal delivery of siRNA about 1.7 fold and of mRNA over 14 fold. Um, we're really excited about these results and the potential of these formulations to enable some ex vivo proof of concept studies in neurons, which are a notoriously difficult cell type to work with and transfect. Um, but we also became really interested in that higher bar of using these systems to attempt to gene edit in neurons. Uh, so that was the question we asked. We wanted to see if we could use these formulations that really effectively deliver payloads to neurons to enable gene editing. Um, so to tackle this, we set out to deliver the components of the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing system using LNPs. Um, just a quick review of CRISPR gene editing technology. It's comprised of two primary components, uh, the Cas9 endonuclease protein, this gray protein shown on the left here, which cuts DNA, as well as the guide RNA, which directs that Cas9 endonuclease to cut at a specific locus dictated by its target sequence. Uh, the Cas9 protein and guide RNA come together in the cell to form a ribonucleoprotein complex, which can then cut and edit genomic DNA in cells at that guide RNA specified location. So to begin testing whether our optimized LNP formulations could improve gene editing outcomes in neurons, we designed this CRISPR experiment. Um, and for this work, we cultured primary neurons from brains of transgenic mice harboring the human progranulin gene. As Blair mentioned, mutations in this gene are associated with some forms of frontotemporal dementia. So therapeutic correction is of really significant interest to us and the field. Um, and to edit the progranulin gene in neurons, we used our optimized mRNA formulation to deliver mRNA encoding that Cas9 endonuclease, so the LNP formulation containing Dogma and DOPE. And we used the optimized MC3 DOPG formulation uh, to deliver the guide RNA targeting the progranulin gene. We also used the MC3 DSPC formulation 
um, as a control to deliver both of the components. And in some cases, we also incorporated a non-targeting scramble guide RNA to assess the specificity of on-target progranulin editing. There are also a few additional experimental design factors that are important to include in any CRISPR-Cas9 experiment that can uh, influence gene editing outcomes. And we included several of these aspects in our experiments. Um, most notably, the ones that I will be focusing on are the ratio of Cas9 mRNA to guide uh, present during cell treatments, uh, the overall reagent dose that we're using, as well as the duration of uh, the exposure of cells to these reagents. Um, and in all of our experiments, our primary outcome measure was the degree of on-target progranulin editing that we were able to detect, which was quantified using Sanger sequencing. And in some cases, we also measured neuronal viability because neurons are very sensitive to any type of exogenous stressor, uh, particularly some lipid-based transfection reagents. So our first experiment compared three ratios of Cas9 mRNA to guide RNA at two Cas9 mRNA doses and at two time points. Uh, this plot shows those two time points, 24 hours shown in red and 48 hours shown in blue. Um, and right now on the slide, we just see the results for delivery using our optimized formulations where uh, DODMA DOPE LNPs were used to deliver mRNA and MC3 DOPG LNPs were used to deliver the guide. Uh, the degree of editing we achieved wasn't overwhelming here, and it was particularly underwhelming compared to the degree of editing that was achieved with this control MC3 DSPC formulation. Um, so it was unfortunate here that we didn't see that these optimized formulations produced uh, a better effect than our control. Um, overall, the efficiency of this approach was quite low um, across all formulations. We only measured about a 1.8% average on target editing of the progranulin gene. Um, and while the impact of LNP formulation in this case wasn't significant, there were some subtle differences in editing magnitude associated with some of these other experimental parameters uh, that we were interested in looking at further. Uh, so for example, we saw that a one-to-one -one Cas9 mRNA to guide RNA ratio produced the best result in the largest number of conditions at both time points and across all formulations. Um, we also saw that a larger Cas9 mRNA dose did appear to improve editing efficiency at 24 hours, um, and that increased exposure to reagents did not significantly improve editing. So in this case, the shorter time frame of exposure was probably the best option for future studies. Um, and while these results weren't uh, particularly encouraging, they were still informative for a first experiment. So we use these different observations to ask if we could improve the results. Um, so we designed a follow-up experiment using sort of the best parameters that we were able to identify from this pilot, uh, which consisted of a one-to-one -one Cas9 mRNA to guide ratio. We decided to increase the Cas9 mRNA dose to three micrograms per milliliter from one. And we also collected neurons at 24 hours following treatment. Um, and in this case, we also included a treatment condition with a non-targeting guide as an additional control. Um, but we didn't see these uh, parameters positively impact our results. Uh, so on this slide, the optimized formulations are shown here in green. Um, and we didn't see any improvement in editing compared to the control, which is shown in gray. And additionally, we also compared uh, on-target editing compared to that scramble in this experiment, and we saw that we weren't actually able to induce any significant on-targeting or on-target progranulin editing. Uh, because viability is also important, we decided to assess that in this experiment. Um, and we did see that not only did different LNP formulations have a different impact on viability, but there was also a really significant amount of cell death that was happening in these experiments. Um, so at this point, we decided to take a step back and just reassess our approach. 
And we thought that because we had used separate LNP formulations to deliver the two components of the CRISPR system, we thought that perhaps uh, transfection efficiency or delivery timing of those formulations was too low to achieve effective editing. So to address this, uh, we decided to take an alternative approach where we formulated Cas9 mRNA and guide within a single LNP. So using this strategy and an identical experimental design as the one from the first experiment I've presented today, we actually did see a modest improvement in editing outcomes with the co-formulation. We tested both optimized formulations to deliver both components, so DODMA DOPE as well as MC3 DOPG. And again, we compared the activity of both of those to the control. Um, and once again, although we didn't see a significant improvement related to LNP composition, there was a very clear effect of time. So in this case, the degree of editing more than doubled between 24 and 48 hours. Uh, using this co-formulation strategy at the 48-hour time point, we also noticed that a 1 to 4 ratio of Cas9 mRNA to guide, so an excess of guide, was more effective than in our previous studies. And similarly to our first attempt using separate formulations, it did seem that a higher Cas9 dose was associated with a more significant editing effect. Um, once again, we also decided to look at neuronal viability uh, because this was important in our previous experiments. So we did a follow-up study to assess viability using the set of conditions that generated the most significant editing results from this co-formulation work. Um, and the results of this experiment actually indicated that cell death um, was a very significant factor. So it was less significant for our optimized formulations, which was positive news, but more than 50% of the cells were dying in all of our treatment conditions. Um, and at this point, we got concerned that um, the gene editing we measured could have potentially been an artifact of cell death rather than genuine on-target editing. So in light of this, we once again reevaluated our approach and decided to measure progranulin editing at lower doses where we could uh, preserve neuronal viability and remove that as a confounding factor. Um, so we used the same optimized treatment parameters identified from the last experiment. So that one to four Cas9 to guide ratio and a 48 hour time point. But in this case, we lowered the Cas9 mRNA dose up to tenfold. Uh, this plot shows the viability of those cells at two lower Cas9 mRNA doses. Um, and here, once again, we saw a unique impact of formulation on neuronal viability. But we also saw that we did choose doses where we were able to almost entirely preserve neuronal viability at at least one treatment which in this case was 0.03 microgram per milliliter mRNA. So we were excited about this possibility and used these treatment parameters to assess on-target progranulin editing. Um, unfortunately, the magnitude of progranulin editing that we measured using these parameters didn't improve editing at either of the doses. Although we did measure a statistically significant signal using one of our optimized formulations, uh, DODMA DOPE. So in this case, it looked like we were able to achieve uh, around 1% on-target progranulin editing as compared to that off-target scramble condition. Um, although not overwhelming, this was a, a good step in the right direction. Um, and although we'd done a lot of work at this point and made some progress, we were also still curious about why we weren't able to achieve more significant editing because we were able to elucidate some factors that could contribute to other aspects of this system working, but the overall magnitude of editing that we measured was still quite low. And because our strategy involves Cas9 delivery in the form of mRNA, we decided to do a, a series of Western blots to look for Cas9 protein to see if the mRNA was being translated in the neurons that we were treating with LNPs. So we blotted for Cas9, which is shown on these blots in green, 
and just compared to a loading control shown in red. Um, and our positive control for these blots uh, was actually Cas9 protein, a ribonucleoprotein provided to us um, from some of our collaborators that was spiked into lysate from untreated neurons. Um, in this case, although the Cas9 protein that we spiked in gave us a nice single or signal, we did see that uh, protein was not detectable using this method in our LNP treated samples using any of the formulations uh, that we set out to test. Um, so while this won't immediately help us improve gene editing efficiency, this experiment was still important uh, for this work just because it does indicate a potential issue with Cas9 mRNA delivery. And it shows that um, while we were able to significantly optimize delivery of simpler cargos like siRNA and mRNA alone, there are other factors that make um, a gene editing application more complex um, in any system, but perhaps particularly in neurons. Um, so improving delivery of Cas9 mRNA is the, the focus of our current and upcoming work. Um, we've learned a few important things that will inform the future work for, of our lab, as well as others from all of these experiments. Um, we show from our screening work that LNP composition can significantly impact formulation efficacy. Um, we also showed that systems optimized for siRNA delivery are not optimal for mRNA delivery to neurons which is something that we didn't expect and important for any type of future experimental design. Um, we also know that neuronal viability is of critical importance for um, in data that is interpretable for these experiments. And for genome editing, we did uh, see that mRNA and guide RNA co-formulation may be slightly more efficient than using separate LNP formulations to deliver CRISPR gene editing components. Um, our future work is primarily focused on improving uh, LNP-mediated delivery of Cas9 while preserving neuronal viability. And then once we are able to achieve good delivery in healthy cells, we will return to evaluating the impact of LNP formulation type on editing efficiency. Um, this work was done largely in the Lovett lab, but it was absolutely a team effort and support, supported by our collaborators, um, both other group members as well as collaborators at UBC. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Terry Petkow, formerly of the Levitt Lab, for supporting all of this work, um, as well as Jay and Jerry from Peter's group for making a lot of the formulations we tested, and Dom from Peter's group as well for lots of helpful discussions in the early experimental design um, of these experiments. I'd also like to thank our collaborators and funding sources, including Enmin, that made it possible for us to do this work. And I'd now like to thank you all for your attention and open the floor to any questions you may have for Blair and myself. Thank you. So the first question uh, is from Tina Chen, who asks, why do you think DOPG was the most potent? Uh, I can take that question. Um, at least for siRNA delivery, uh, it was most potent and that phospholipid does have a negative charge in it. So that could potentially improve the, um, the delivery of the small siRNA. Um, it does become a little bit more complex when we ask the question of why DOPG wasn't the most potent with mRNA, but particle size is also an important characteristic to consider. Um, and in this case, the DOPG particles were also slightly larger, which means that more material can be delivered per endocytic event. So that's likely also a portion of why we saw a better effect there. I see. The second question comes from Kyla Hingwing, who asks, is Cas9 mRNA not being delivered or is it not being expressed? Um, so again, a great question, and that's something that we're trying to tease apart because while we don't see protein expression, the question of delivery to the cell and expression is not exactly the same thing. Uh, my hypothesis is 
that it's probably a combination of both of those factors. Um, encapsulation in an LNP of both the mRNA along with the guide is a little bit more complicated than just a single um, type of molecule. So it's possible that although the overall encapsulation efficiency of our formulations was quite good, um, that there are either some empty particles or there is some, um, some issue with the actual delivery of that mRNA to neurons. Um, Cas9 mRNA is also significantly larger than the luciferase reporter we use. It's almost 50% larger. So uh, translation from those larger mRNAs is less efficient, and particularly in neurons, which are um, not, not quiescent, but relatively so compared to dividing cells. It might just be that the translational activity for those longer mRNAs is uh, lower than we anticipated. And Sarah, maybe you can address, I know you did the experiments, um, mm -hmm. the fact that the mRNA has the potential to create the protein. So you did some experiments to prove that the mRNA was functional. Yes, um, we did use a commercial transfection reagent to deliver the same mRNA that we formulated in LNPs um, to a dividing cell line just to make sure that there was still activity with that nucleic acid. And we did get Emma, a Cas9 protein expression in a dividing cell line using that approach. So the mRNA itself in these systems has the potential to be translated into protein. And that actually is also, um, answer, I think there's an, an, a question about using lipofectamine. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, we can't use lipofectamine in, in primary neurons. These are very difficult to transfect cells and standard transfection techniques just uh, end up killing all the cells. So in order to prove that the mRNA was, work, was working, we did use a commercial reagent, but we used it in uh, HEC293 cells, a uh, uh, cell type in which you can. So. I, I, that, that's the answer to why we can't use lipofectamine in primary neurons as well. Hi, Sarah. That was really that was really great. I, um, in retrospect to the end of your talk, what was going on when you saw that difference between waiting twenty four and forty eight hours? So the difference between that experiment and the other experiment that I presented was. Um, first of all, the LNPs were two separate formulations to deliver the cargos versus co-formulation. And I think that the reason we did see the slight increase only in the case of co-formulation is that we were measuring some on-target editing. And one of the challenges between translating these reporter systems into a more complex approach like this is that luciferase mRNA in particular is translated very quickly. And you can see a, a reliable luciferase signal even after four hours of treatment. So um, in the case of gene editing, we need the mRNA to be translated into um, protein. Then that needs to associate with a guide to form a ribonucleoprotein complex translocated into the nucleus and then editing at that site has to occur, which is obviously a more complex process than just translation of a protein in the cytoplasm. So um, barring the, that confounding factor of toxicity, I think what's happening with that time point is that increased exposure to those reagents is actually just giving them time to have their intended editing effect. Thank you. So oh, then Xiaoming Zhu was asking, um, have you tested your new, your new formulations in vivo in the brain? In vitro situations might be quite different from in vivo. Thanks. So um, uh, I'm happy to answer this one, Sarah. I'll give you a bit of a break. <laughs> <laughs> so absolutely, this was a, 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 the next step in, in, in our experiments. And this, this was an, an aspect of the program that was carried forward by a very talented uh, former um, postdoc and research associate, Terry Petkow, as Sarah uh, mentioned, 
And we have looked at the in vivo delivery of the of, of, of the luciferase mRNA and the uh, primarily the siRNA. Um, and I think to summarize, we, we did see some improvements in, in those experiments, but um, we we haven't got to a point where we we feel confident moving forward with uh, the more complex genome editing experiments. So the goal is ultimately to bring those in vivo, but um, the, m much of the work Sarah has presented today hasn't been taken in vivo yet. Great, thanks for that. Um, then there's a question from Wen, Wen Chen Zhao who asks, how much PEG is pre present in these formulations? Uh, PEG can often cause toxicity in the in vitro work. Yeah, that's definitely true. 1% um, PEG is something we used for all of these formulations. And we actually decided to fix the molar ratio of the composition when we were doing screening just to avoid uh, basically creating an incredibly complex matrix of treatments to test for the screening work. So all of these formulations are 50% ionizable cationic lipid, 39% cholesterol, 10% helper lipid or phospholipid, and 1% PEG. We have gone up to at least 3% uh, peg with neurons, I believe, and we haven't seen a significant effect on um, on neuronal health. It's largely the the nucleic acid dose and the overall lipid dose that we see has um, really significant effects on viability. Thanks. Um, Yasmin asks, do you think the complex niche microenvironment of the brain plays a role in hindering the targeting of the formulations? Um, consider uh, perhaps secretions or genes that interact with the formulations. It's a it's a great question, Yasmin. I, I I don't know that we can really make a lot of comments with the all of the formulations and and, and the more recent work, which has all been ex vivo. So in the ex vivo system, we're isolating um, the primary neurons and really just looking at once you've delivered the LNP to the neuron. Um, looking at uptake and expression within within the cell. Um, our experience to date has been when we have efficient and effective delivery to neurons uh, ex vivo in that system, and we do direct delivery into the target region, there is similar levels of uptake and expression. Um, so I, I we it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. The, the brain is very complex and the microenvironment is, and, and obviously in our primary neuron cultures, we only have a single cell type. We don't have astrocytes, microglia, oligodendrocytes, other, other cell types, which might influence and, and, and certainly uptake the LNPs. But uh, when we've looked at LNP delivery in vivo, we see um, similar levels of uptake that we see. So I, I, I don't know, and, and we can't answer the question, um, but as we move forward, we'll certainly um, get more information on that. That my 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 simplistic answer is, we don't see that the microenvironment is altering the efficiency uh, significantly, and what seems to work in primary neurons seems to work with direct delivery in vivo. Two more questions from Tina Chen. Why do you think delivering Cas9 affected neuronal uh, viability, and how do you plan to preserve? neuronal viability in the future? Uh, this is a great question. Um, and it really, I think, comes down to the ratios that we chose to deliver uh, Cas9 and Guide together. So um, what we did to make these experiments consistent was we calculated all of our dosing based on the amount of Cas9 mRNA that was present. But in order to then deliver various different amounts of guide with that constant Cas9, there's a lot of difference in the amount of lipid that is present in those formulations for the same dose of mRNA. So an excess of guide requires more lipid to encapsulate as compared to less. And what we see, especially with the formulations we used where there was an excess of guide in that one to four pairing, uh, viability was a significant concern. So one of the things that I'm interested in testing is going back to reformulate and actually um, altering that ratio where um, mRNA is in excess rather than guide. 
to try to maximize the amount of um, Cas9 expression we get while there's still enough guide to enable targeting. Uh, that means we can deliver both components with significantly less lipid, which I think will really help um, the neuronal health aspect of these experiments. And 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 maybe a follow up that helps to answer the next question that Tina raised, which is, okay. you know. We, we, we had extensive experience delivering siRNA uh, you know for for many years and we we've, we've I'll take a step back we have in the lab really tested every possible transfection technique in these primary neuronal culture systems we've looked at all the various uh electroporation and 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 viral media delivery as well as all the commercial reagents and we've never seen anything that was as effective or as as well tolerated as LNP delivery. And again, most of that work was done with um, small siRNAs. But we actually were really, I think the presentation probably <laughs> undersells us. We were really surprised at the levels of toxicity we were getting and the complexity when you go from a small siRNA now to more complex formulations that in, include an mRNA and an sRNA. And, and you know, as, as you increase the complexity of your, your cargo, uh, the number of parameters that can change and do change and the number of parameters that Sarah has tested uh, go up really dramatically. And, and um, you know, we, 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 we were actually really shocked um, when we get to these more complex systems that we started to have these problems with viability. We've worked for many years with sRNA and, and really see almost no, uh, we've seen very high levels of, of targeting uh, with very low levels of, of, of toxicity and very high viability and, and saw that translate very nicely in vivo. So um, one of the things that is a, is a take home is that as you move to more complex cargos, um, things get more complicated. So we were absolutely, convinced and are still absolutely convinced that LNP delivery to the brain is, is is a safe delivery system and it works very well with certainly simple cargos. Um, but we're finding that when we move to these more complex systems, it's it's a it, it's it's taking more work and more effort, but I think we'll get there. Can I ask a sort of a related question, which is so we've been playing with different, you know, lengths of of, of nucleic acids that we load into lipid nanoparticles and Efficiencies are quite affected by the structure that the are, are can be affected by the structure that is adopted by the nucleic acid inside. So I was just curious to know when you do your loading efficiencies, um, um, uh, did you have equal? You know, you you sometimes double loaded nucleic acids in one nanoparticle, sometimes in individual ones into separate ones. Did you notice either variations in so did you get loading efficiencies that were, I didn't even know what your values were. Maybe you quoted them, but I didn't see them. Um, I don't remember hearing them. Were they different on the three, the three circumstances? You know, one type, the second type, or both together into the same LNP? Right, um, so we measure uh, encapsulation efficiency for all of these formulations. Uh, I didn't show that data just for time today but all of them were at least 85% or higher. And I think the, the general benchmark is 80% or higher is considered um, sufficient. Um, it was a very good encapsulation, both for the case of the separate particles, as well as in the case of co-formulation. Mm -hmm. um, and I have seen some data, like you said, that shows with increased mRNA size or perhaps secondary structure that there is less efficient encapsulation. Uh, yeah. We haven't seen that here, but it's possible that um, there is something else going on with the, the physical structure of the particles that means um, this system is, has been more difficult to adopt. Yeah, I suspect some of the things that are intended to, to inhibit endonucleases may be at play sometimes, but um, that's very interesting. And then one question, um, if I might, um, the efficiency was uh, um, higher when the two uh, nucleic acid cargos were carried together. Could you just, or, or as I recall, could you yes. just tell me why you thought that was true? Did it have to do with the timing of the bio? Why do you think that was better? So um, we have done a little bit of work on um, 
working out transfection efficiency of different formulations um, in neurons, also ex vivo. And transfection efficiency is, is reasonable and sort of compared to what you would see with a commercial reagent, but it's also not 100%. And I think delivering um, guide RNA in one formulation type and Cas9 mRNA in another means that fewer cells are go both going to endocytose both types of particles and actually end up or produce the result of uh, Cas9 protein and guide RNA being present in the cytoplasm to form the complex that's required for editing than if you deliver both of those molecules together. Um, because when they're separate, only a subset of those cells is going to take up mRNA particles and only a subset will take up the guide particles. But there's nothing to say that uh, those populations of cells are the same. So at least with the co-formulation experiment, we know that if we are getting endocytosis, we are delivering both types of nucleic acid simultaneously. Yeah, right. And, and maybe Gilbert to follow up on, on your on your your question. Uh, you know, it may have it may have been somewhat um, simplistic for us to think that you know all mRNAs are going to be the same. And, and I think the small sRNAs, because they're very much more consistent in their size and length, probably a, a single formulation will probably be, be broadly applicable. But I think one of the unfortunate take homes from this is that likely MR, different mRNAs may, may have different optimal optimized formulations. And, and, you know, we've optimized to, 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 um, you know, uh, a, a, a GFP mRNA, and, and that may not be this optimal formulation for Cas9, and it may not be for other mRNAs based on size and 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 subsequent uh, secondary structure. So uh, that's that, that I think is an unfortunate take home. And and the, I guess the other thing I would say is we we do need to be careful about over interpreting too much. I mean, we do think that that the data was supportive that the co delivery was probably better, but the levels of uh, of editing efficiency are so low that uh, and and perhaps in some in, in in some of the experiments there was none, and the expression of Cas9 was low and undetectable. That I, I don't want to, you know, I, I think we should be cautious in over interpreting any of the data. But we're, you know, I think Sarah's done a great job of of gleaning what we can from the from the experimental data that that's there. But we don't want to over interpret things. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, the caution I agree with, but I also agree with the excellence of the results in terms of the quality of what's being uh, analyzed. Um, there are a couple of questions here um, from Natalia. The question is, what were zeta potentials of the two optimized formu formulations? Do you know? We actually didn't measure zeta potential of these formulations, but it's not the first time I've had that question. Uh, and it's definitely something we'll look into because it is important. Right. Um, the last question, or the, 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 the second to last question on the chat is, um, what about a different ionizable lipid? Uh, and then they describe um, Moderna, the SM102, and the MC3. Um, and it has to do with tolerance. I guess the answer is there are a lot of places you could go with different formulations. This is a sort of a generalization I, I might make. Um, and um, would you want to add to that, Sarah? Any comments? What other formulation might you imagine trying? Sure. Um, I will say that for the sake of this presentation, uh, the data was condensed to what was um, most easily discussed. We have tested more formulations and more ionizable lipids than um, I've shown here. Uh, it is a good point that there are some new lipids, including like ALC0315, which is in the, the BioNTech COVID vaccine, that are incredibly potent, that weren't available to us when we started this program. Um, and it, it would definitely be probably worthwhile to test some of those new lipids if we could get our hands on them. Um, I think I would revise the experimental design a little bit for this application specifically. Um, but we could also incorporate them into a screening experiment. It, it just sort of depends like what we're interested in in doing with the, the optimized formulations. I think there's a gigantic horizon with a lot of exciting things to try. And I think um, you guys are on a good direction for that.